No, that's a Frank Zappa album cover. Is it no, really? no, it is. Uh, it, it looks like it, though. It looks like uh, it. Yeah. Are you ready, <laughs> John? Yeah, I'm recording. Okay. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's first talk. Our speaker this afternoon is Pete Corral. He's uh, semi-retired from Lados, where he's had a career tra chasing asteroids, meteors, other <laughs> things that go boom, boom, bump in the night. Uh, <laughs> And he's now very active at the Turner Farm uh, Joint Observatory between the Analemma Society and Fairfax County. Um, he's also had his uh, meteor gear here, although I don't know if you, you haven't gotten anything. We yet. caught three uh, the first on Friday three. night. Friday night. And then it got clouded over. Some clarity, we'll get some more meteors. Yeah. But uh, for now, he's talking about the uh, observatory at Turner Farm. It's the first of three talks we have this afternoon about observatories. So with that, I'll introduce Peter. Thanks, Alan. Thanks uh, for inviting me out here to talk again. I, I spoke last year on meteors. I promise this year I will not discuss meteors. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about the work that I've been uh, supporting out at the new observatory that just opened up in Great Falls. I don't know how many of you are actually from the Washington area, some probably from outside the area. Um, but Great Falls is uh, kind of near the Potomac River and just Oh, I'd say about 20 miles west of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I'll go through the history, uh, actually, of, that, of the site itself. It wasn't an observatory until just recently. Um, and then the current status of the site in terms of uh, being used as a public outreach uh, facility. So if we go to the next slide, uh, there's a fellow named um, Charles Olin, who's in char uh, head of the president of the uh, Analema Society. He insisted that, you know, I went back in time, and he said you know, I had to go even further back in time. Uh, I didn't quite go back to the time of the Indians, but essentially when uh, the British were in the area, this is what's called the Northern Neck, uh, Lord Thomas Fair, uh, Lord Fairfax Baron Cameron, he's the sixth Fairfax Lord, uh, actually lived in uh, the colonies as opposed to the previous lords that all lived over in, um, in Britain. And he inherited the lands, essentially, that, uh, from his mother. And they encompassed a fairly large area, that from basically the Chesapeake Bay on the eastern side, up the Potomac River was the northern boundary with Maryland, between Maryland and Virginia, out into the Shenandoah, where the Potomac kind of loops over, and then it was bordered on the south by the Rappahannock River. That encompasses, if, again, if you're from Washington, that encompasses the counties of Loudoun, Fairfax, Prince William, and I cannot recall offhand which the one that's down by the Chesapeake, but uh, it's uh, quite a large, large area. Uh, the actual site for the facility nowadays is uh, located right about in here, uh, in the western, northwestern portion of Fairfax County is where we have the observatory site. Um, of course, Lord Fairfax owned this land until we had the American Revolution, in which case we confiscated it away from him. And then I'm not going to go through the entire history of how all that got deeded away, but if we jump to the next slide, we're going to fast forward to 1905, essentially when the 52 acres that makes up uh, Turner Farm was established. It was originally established as a dairy farm. The, uh, these are actually uh, recent photographs of the house and the, uh, the dairy barn itself has been re refurbished. Uh, they've been there, uh, I'm sorry, um, that, that is the original homes. You can see an old aerial photograph here. You can see the barn up there, and you can see the, uh, the house here. This is actually a historical site, and um, the Great Falls Citizens Association is actually uh, allows people to live in here. You have to sort of propose to sort of buy it and live there, maintain the facility as it is. Uh, while you're resident and I believe they finally they had a number of applications come in and they've actually got somebody who's going to be moving into that location most of these buildings have not are now gone but like I said they still have the original barn and the original house uh, they just it was strictly a dairy barn uh, for, for basically up until 1969 Mark Turner senior and Mark Turner junior both ran that farm so next slide basically in 1954, uh, we got into a paranoid state, obviously because we were worried about the Russians. The Russians were going to fly bombers, essentially, over the pole and possibly bomb our uh, major cities in the United States. And so to, uh, to shoot these bombers down, we had new missile, missile technology and decided to actually set up a missile site. And Turner's farm, a portion of it, about 12 acres, was taken over 
to be used as the radar site. And then about a mile down the road on a road called Utterback Store Road, road was actually where the missiles were located. Um, this was basically to defend Washington. They had these around Baltimore, New York, and I think the uh, next slide shows a map. Yeah, so the map. So here we are. This is the Great Falls uh, site. You can see this ring basically around Baltimore and Washington, one around Philly, New York area, some of the major cities in Connecticut. And they basically peppered all around the major cities in the United States. Next slide. So what was a Nike? It was a Nike missile site. So what is a Nike missile site? Uh, essentially, it was all these were all above ground. So this is, don't think silos. This is not ICBMs. These are actually anti-aircraft missiles. Uh, they were all on the surface. They were all in a down position. And then when they were launched, they went up into a vertical position. Uh, they do not go to a straight up orientation, according to a, a person who actually worked at this site that I, uh, that I knew uh, that lives over in Great Falls. He said they went to about a 97 degree angle. Anybody know why? Essentially, if you launch straight up and your engine kicks out, it comes right back down on top of your other missiles that are sitting there. So you launch at an angle and hope that it just falls downrange. Uh, the way these systems worked, you had a uh, low far, uh, a long range uh, target acquisition system that picked up the supposedly the bombers at di uh, distance. You then had a tracking radar that followed those bombers. And then you had a separate radar, a third radar, that basically when the missile got launched, tracked that and try to get these two to basically merge together and, and uh, take them out. They never fired a missile while they were over, in, uh, in at least from the Great Falls site. These are photographs actually taken out in the southwest. The images I was able to get, it's very hard to find any images of the Great Falls site, uh, but the, the missile image is there, but you can't see any missiles on it. Next slide. So this is the actual Turner Farm site. So the missile site was, again, a mile away down the road. Turner Farm site is where they had the acquisition radar, the tracking radar, and the missile radar. And some of those buildings actually still exist today. So where our observatory is located now is that red box sitting in the image there. Uh, this is an aerial view from back in the 1955. All these buildings are long since gone. But this and this are two radar buildings. They actually still exist today, but the radars have been long since removed. And you can see the rest of this is, this is all pasture land for the, uh, for the cows that they basically had out there. Next slide. Can you see the farm from there? Like the farm uh, go, back, there? go back up. So the farm basically borders this road here. This is Springvale Road. This is the entrance. It's sort of the edge right about here. And it heads back 52 acres off in this direction. Sorry. Uh, I was uh, reading that uh, the radar site that uh, Tyson's car once was part of the uh, communication network. It was created at the same. You know that there is now there is a major radar in Tyson's corner. So oh, in Tyson's corner? Yeah. You mean that tall? Yeah, it's a double radar. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it was part of the same system. They don't show it. They don't show it on the maps for the Nike sites. Uh, all the, the sites are further out west. It might have been. So Tyson's is a high spot, and you, you, I don't know if you've ever seen the big, there's huge microwave towers up there uh, that the telephone company used to use because it was a nice space to uh, line a site to the distant mountains. <coughs> so that lasted basically from, uh, I think it was 53 to about 59, 50, 60. And then the U.S. Army Map Service took over the facility. And so they were done with, they took, they dismantled the, the mis missile site and they went and they started doing research on geolocation. And the reason for this is um, they were having difficulties creating a world map. Uh, they were able to do surveys of the land, let's say of the continental US, or they could do Japan, or they could do an island, or they could do Australia, but they couldn't tie them all together because there was no way to, you know, literally do the, the, the jumping and the, and the survey markings across the ocean. Uh, so they started investigating using satellites uh, as in terms of trying to get the positions of all these little islands and basically create an integrated earth map as opposed to what we had prior to that. And of course that led on to the GPS uh, system eventually. So go to the next slide. So what happened was uh, one of the radar sites, the building, you can't see it, it's just off the image there, is still standing today. This one was augmented and actually a dome was put up there and I couldn't get a full size image, but there was a 24 inch telescope actually up in the top of that dome. And of course that building structure still exists today. 
That 24 inch is now at Apache Point Observatory out in New Mexico. And we had a 14 inch in there for a while, but we had to take it down because this particular structure here uh, is having some issues with water infiltration. Uh, you can see some of the buildings there. Uh, basically, this became a support facility where all the information came in from around the world to try to determine the, the geoid of the Earth. And uh, they, they did a very good job. But it took many, many, many years. You can see it started in 61 and went all the way right, right through to 1993 before they actually closed the facility down. Uh, the U.S. Army Map Service kind of morphed into the Defense Mapping Agency. Some of you probably have heard of DMA. And then eventually DMA became the forerunner of the National uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency, otherwise known as NGA. Uh, go to the next slide. So what did they do between 64 and 69? This was sort of a precursor. They, they sort of had the idea of doing GPS, but you know, really didn't have much of the technology then. But they were worried more at this point in trying to, again, tie together geodetically North America, Australia, Japan, a lot of the Pacific Islands. And the way they did that is they would set up three sites, these red squares, that essentially were very well surveyed. And then they had this satellite orbiting, which you can see in the upper left uh, picture there. It was just a repeater. There's a transmitter on the ground at each of those three sites. It would transmit up to the satellite. Satellite would trans return the signal back. And you could do ranging that way. And so you get a range from each of these three points to the satellite, and that actually gives you the satellite then in three-dimensional coordinates. And once you know that, and you follow it through a small arc of the orbit, and you have a fourth site, which you have not surveyed, but we're trying to find out its location, you have another transmitter there that talks to the satellite at the same time, and you could actually get that range, and you could pinpoint your location on the Earth fairly accurately. And you just kept doing that. You kept moving these sites around. There was very few of these, but this guy keeps moving around basically the surface of the Earth. And eventually they mapped the whole Earth. That's why it took so long. Uh, at least it took five years to do that. So this leads on to eventually something called Navstar, and then eventually on to, on to GPS. And so GPS, of course, becomes operational about 1995. But basically from the 60s to 93 is where all these, what they call special mission tracking programs, that's all they want to call it. You can't find any more information about it other than that. But they involved not just these, the Secor type uh, satellites, but a, a whole series of them. There was something called Transit, which was the Navy system for locating ships in the early days. Uh, CSAT, GEOS, MAGSAT, GEOSAT, and eventually what they built was a, the WGS map of the, of the, of the Earth, very, very precisely. Precisely, and this is just a this is not an initial launch. This is sort of a more recent launch, 10 years ago, <coughs> of the GPS uh, more recent block um, um, si system that they set up there. And of course, as you know, GPS has got 24 satellites out in um, at MEO orbit, what they call MEO orbit, uh, that are just or so somebody on the ground is always visible, like four or five or six satellites at any given time. So next <coughs> slide. So what happens? They launch the G GPS, it's operational in 1995. No longer any need to do all this analysis and surveying on the ground. And the place kind of, you can see, got into a little bit of disrepair, was, was being underutilized, or probably not utilized at all from what I could tell. Uh, a little bit rusty there. And so the Department of Interior actually hands it over, these 12 acres, uh, probably more than that, I forget how many acres they actually owned. They turn that over to the Fairfax County Park Authority. Park Authority doesn't know what to do with it. <coughs> got the site, all these derelict build buildings. They took down most of the buildings, but they did leave this tall structure here with the dome, and that radar block is still standing uh, today, but there's no radar in there. So this picture was taken before <coughs> 2003. Next slide. So Fairfax County doesn't know what to do with this. The Fairfax County uh, Great Falls Citizens Association apparently reaches out to the community there and asked, well, how can we best use this farm now that the county has gotten hold of it? And so Charles Olin, the fellow uh, situated there in that picture, uh, comes back and he says, hey, I'd like to build an observatory. I'd like to have people be able to come out, look through telescopes, learn about the universe, and get inspired by this stuff. And so he started a campaign basically in 93. It took all the way to 2016 to actually have something realized here. But it started really back in, at that time frame. He's also the president and founder of the Analima Society, which is sort of a bunch of sundial people. Uh, they actually have a sundial garden set up uh, in the, on, the, on the Turner farm. Um, but there was a master plan, and then you had to deal with 
putting agreements between the Analima Society and the Fairfax County Park Authority, uh, obtaining bonds. Uh, this all went on for a number of years. We actually got donations. This is actually, fair, Great Falls is a fairly uh, ritzy part of uh, the Washington suburbs. And so uh, Rick uh, Edelman basically donated equipment uh, for, for the, as far as the equipment was concerned. And then the roll, roll top construction actually started about in 2014, wasn't completed until about 2016. So we go to the next slide. So a number of things happened in the time that the initial thought of putting an observatory in and the actual facility, uh, the, the uh, facility was completed. And it's still a work in progress, actually, to be perfectly honest. In 2007, um, again, because the Analyme Society is not the sundials, actually, they started a sundial as the first phase. They put one in uh, basically on the quincentennial of the Jamestown landing in Virginia, uh, colony in, in Virginia. And so you can actually go and visit that on the site, uh, that particular sundial. Next slide. So if you know anything about Great Falls, it's also big horse country for folks. And so the not only was Charles Olin interested in having an observatory put there, but he also, uh, there, were, there was a large group that actually wanted to have an equestrian center. So it turned out they were complementary type things. These folks ride in the daytime. We tend to go out at night. So it was actually worked out quite well. So we didn't have interference with parking lots and then that sort of thing. So they actually built an equestrian center. Uh, it's just a, ride, a big riding ring. They have both a flat ring and they also have a steeplechase area. Uh, next to the barn, so they're actually quite a far away from the, uh, the observatory site. They put a, Fairfax County put a pavilion in and a playground. Uh, that was basically 2010. Next slide. And then they also got bond money to refurbish the dome. So they wanted to take that tower and, as far as the observatory was concerned, and make it robotic. The issue was this tower is probably narrower than the width of this building. And it has a staircase in there, like from an old battleship. So very steep, not OSHA compliant. People going up there could fall down, get, get themselves hurt. So they didn't want people going in there. So they thought, well, let's put a robotic system in there. But to do that, the old ash dome that was up, up there could not be computer controlled. It had basically had to be turned by hand. And so uh, I guess then in 2010, they got a bond basically to replace that dome with another ash dome. Uh, this one was fully controllable, and that's the one that's sitting up there today. And as you can see, they were kind of redoing the outside and, and cleaning, up the, cleaning up the place. Next slide. So 2011, they, uh, took, they bought a 14-inch mead, uh, threw that up into the, uh, into the dome with an AP-1200 mount. And uh, some folks had used that for a little bit of astronomical research, but it really hadn't been open to the public at that point. And then finally, it turned out in spring of 2017, we noticed some bulges in the side of that tall building due to water infiltration and some of the concrete well, blocks were being shifted out. Uh, they shut the building down. We, we pulled the telescope out, pulled the mount out because we worried if the building, for whatever reason, may have collapsed or during the reconstruction phase, the damage the telescope, we, we took that out of there. So that was a, that was a challenge. Uh, I had to get a crane in basically to drop it down into the floor. Um, and so at the moment, there is nothing sitting in that dome. We're waiting for Fairfax County to make an assessment on the, the usability of the building. Uh, that is yet to be uh, uh, come forthcoming yet. So we go to the next slide. Nevertheless, they went forward with a observatory that was supposed to be a roll top type design. Now, in the original plans that in 2014, when the groundbreaking actually occurred, it was supposed to have four roll tops. It was going to be like in a cross type shape and one telescope essentially in each of those ends of those points and each one would have its own separate roll top roof. This would be a much smaller roll top. Apparently there were a number of design changes over the year and a half as they went through this and the roll top eventually morphed into a single roll top, large roll top roof that encompasses 12 telescope uh, locations in the building. This is an extremely heavy roof, weighs something like three tons. And so the building itself is like built like a bunker. It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible. County got over a million dollars in park, bon uh, park bonds, essentially, to build this particular facility. And uh, in addition, we were able to get something called a Mastenbrook grant to buy equipment, as well as the Edelman, Edelman donation allowed us to buy the telescopes to basically install in the, uh, in the facility. C keep going. 
So finally, August 2016, construction is completed. They started it in the spring of 2016, really broke ground. Uh, even though it said 2014, they really dug the hole <laughs> in 2016. And uh, the construction was finally completed. And so now you can see the left side of this image is where the classroom is located. On the right side is, you know, you can see it looks like a bunker. It's just concrete walls. They're painted now. Uh, but there's where, where four telescopes are located. Uh, there's a parking lot basically up there at the top of the image. And there's this path that's lit that we never turn the lights on because they're, too, they're white lights. I don't know what the county was thinking of. At an astronomical observatory, you put white LED lights, right? So <laughs> more lighting issues. And this, this photograph was taken actually from the top of that tower that, uh, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, you can see they, they, don't, they air condition or you know, weather condition the classroom. So it's heated in the wintertime. It's cool in the summertime. Uh, but we don't do that on the telescope side because you have to open, open the roof and you actually want that room to be at ambient air temperature. So what they do is uh, they actually have, you can see this little fan here. If it gets too warm in there, that kicks on and draws in ambient cooler air from the outside than what's inside there. We find that this roof here is actually quite reflective. Most of the, uh, the light and the heat seems to stay off it. We don't really get a, a, a big warm up in there. But one thing we did do is on the intake side, they had it basically a louvers that would open up. Now we would get pollen and crap in the air in the Washington area. When that, can't, that fan kicks on, all kinds of stuff comes in there. We have, of course, covers on our telescopes, but still, you got all this crap in there. So we actually went out to Home Depot and bought some filters and just stuck it on the, the input takes, and we're, we seem to be good. So things have been staying pretty clean in there. Uh, we also noticed that the metal roof, it rained inside one time. Uh, it, it, it happened to be an extremely damp day in Washington last fall. Uh, and then a cold front came through and dropped below freezing. And basically all the ribbing on the inside surface got damp and then started dripping onto the telescopes. But uh, from there on in, we started putting covers, plastic covers essentially, on all the telescopes whenever we pack up and leave. So next slide. Uh, those walls are about eight feet, yeah. but it, you'd think that would keep the wind out and be a nice windbreak. Wintertime, it's pretty windy up there. It's somewhat elevated location, and uh, th those telescopes shake. It, they catch that dew, the dew shield in the front, and they just vibrate, you know. So uh, summertime, we find it's fine. Conditions are actually quite nice, but, uh, yeah, we need some, like, more windbreaks outside, bushes or, you know, some evergreens. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, here's what the building, again, from uh, layout looks like. We have this classroom, there's lavatories. Apparently, it's a requirement for the certain size and the pe number of people we have going in here. We can hold classrooms up to a capacity of about 25. We typically will run maybe 10 and 20, depending upon the class. Like, Bill, I think what are you, you're limited to about 15 in your class size, and that's just sheer how to handle a crowd that's going to be looking strictly at the moon. Uh, but other classes where we're not necessarily using the telescopes, we can handle up to 25. And then in, on, the, uh, on the telescope side, uh, we have three Pure Tech 2s. Uh, they put those in. These are nice adjustable height um, pedestals. They start out about two feet and they come up about this high. Uh, great for the refractor, uh, especially for uh, handicapped folks. But we have two SCTs in there. And it turns out you still have to get pull somebody out of a wheelchair for them to look through an SCT up on a pure tech. Um, and I'll show you what we, uh, so, sort of the solution that we have there. And then we have one open slot where they haven't put a pier in so we could use this freestanding type of tripod. Next slide. So here's what we have uh, installed. We put these in in September. Uh, again, from the grant from the Yettlemans. We have a very nice seven inch AP 180 refractor sitting on an AP 1200 uh, go-to mount. And the planets in this thing are absolutely gorgeous. Just love, love using this refractor. Uh, we have an 11 inch Celestron sitting uh, in the, I guess that would be the Northeast Pier. And then there's a 14 inch Mead. Now that 14 inch is what was originally in that tall tower. And we just decided to put it on there. Th these two are both on AP 1100 mounts. Uh, that 14 inch drives us crazy. Uh, you'll get it in focus and then you'll switch the meridian to the other side and sometimes it doesn't even line up. And we spend a lot of time aligning these scopes, doing the polar alignment. 
And they all work fairly well, but that 14 inch is always driving us nuts anytime we flip meridian sides. And so we have to go kind of hunt around for the, uh, for the object. So we kind of learned a, a, a procedure here. You know, you kind of go to a bright star on that side of the meridian. If you know you're going, going to flip sides and then, uh, and then go to the object and then you usually can get it centered up pretty quickly because you could sync these telescopes up very, very, very rapidly. All right, what else? No, next one is, um, so we had, like I said, we have these PureTech 2 t pedestals. Um, like I said, they don't always get down low enough for handicapped folks, so somebody donated a set of binoculars on one of those parallelogram mounts. I'm sure you guys have seen this and used them. Uh, that is actually fantastic for folks that come in that are handicapped, uh, being able to bring it down to their level and not have to pick them up or anything like that. And it's good for seeing some of a lot of the bright objects that are out there. And of course, Bill talked earlier th this morning, He's basically occupied the fourth slot in the, uh, in the facility with his uh, eight inch uh, re reflector there. And the reason we have uh, these types of scopes in there is we tried to give an example to the public of each of the styles. You got a refractor, you got a reflector, and we have two SCTs. Uh, and so that was the, uh, the idea. Eventually we'd like to replace that. There's a, Charles actually has a 16 inch reflector, but it's still, it needs some alignment issue, uh, work done on it. So I don't know when it's actually going to go in, but we've been using Bill's telescope for lunar stuff, and it's just been absolutely great. And it also, you know, the other three are all go-to telescopes, and then you, you, sh you have the public there, and you say, I've got to actually manually move this thing around. It does track, but I have to move it around. And they're, like, really surprised by that, but they, they, they really, uh, they actually learn something uh, when, they're, when they're there visiting. Uh, people are really wowed by the, the, the equipment that, that, are, that is uh, located at this facility. Next slide. So just another shot, kind of give you a perspective of how, the, how big the room is. It's actually fairly roomy between the telescopes. We'll, right, we'll either put the binoculars in the middle there or we'll take them outside on the, on the patio, out the uh, little uh, concrete uh, pads that we have out there. You can see the county wasn't, or whoever designed this wasn't too smart. I don't know if you noticed, these are electrical outlets. We have AC and 12 volt DC and a, and a um, internet type connection. Uh, on those three electrical boxes, but they were just sticking right out of the ground. And they're about, as you can see, about two feet away from each of the pedestals, and they're a great tripping hazard in the dark. So the county solution to this was to build these metal yellow boxes and bolt them to the ground, you know? So we haven't had any accidents yet. I'm not quite clear on the connection of three things. This looks roomy. This is it the looks roomy. The, the slide box yeah. The yeah, this is that the half and of the, the building. No, no, that's a separate building. It's, you get to it from a walkway. Yes, they have all 12 acres there. Actually, they have all 52 acres. No, no, I wasn't. I actually came in just as I was retiring last year. This was coming online, essentially, in the sp summer of 2016. And I just was able to spend... Ann Lima basically provided the guidance to the designers. And, but they, don't, they didn't quite see eye to eye on a lot of things. And so people missed these little nuances. You know, Yeah, they saw an electrical outlet on the diagram, but they didn't see what it was going to look like when it was installed. Yeah, well, they put a yellow box around it, so because we still have to get in there. But it was smarter to just fl floor mount it, flush floor mount it. You know, they weren't thinking. Whoever designed it, they're bolted into the floor. So there's actually, I don't know if you see it here. There's big bolts on this, big nuts. Well, they're isolated because you can see these cuts here. So those, I don't know if they got rubber in there, but they they have isolated from the rest of the concrete structure. So that was brought up. But I'll tell you, the wind is a bigger problem than the, the road traffic vibration. Yeah, but they did, they did try to isolate that as best as they could. And that's another reason, supposedly, that they tell us that these were put so far away from the pedestal is that electrical conduit is in the outside, this outside concrete area, not in this pad. But you could have put something flexible in there and it wouldn't have been a problem. I, I don't know where these people were coming from. So, and they also got bright light. I don't know if you notice, there's a nice big bright white light there. <laughs> so we turn that off. But it has red lights all around, so at night uh, people can see where they're going and not trip over things. 
Um, but it's, uh, it's really nice. It does look roomy. The fire code requirements are we have to have no more than 15 people in there. We've gotten about 25, and uh, it starts to get a little, little, little uh, tight. So What's the floor dimensions on that? Oh, I, s I did the measurements. I think it's 25 feet by 25 feet. Each of these are about six feet away from the wall. They were originally five feet away, and Alan caught that a pretty Alan had figured caught that pretty early and moved them a little closer in, specifically for the refractor. It's a big tube, and we worried about it swinging around and getting kind of close to the uh, to the wall. So those are six feet in. So yeah, this looks like maybe about 24, 25 feet, uh, maybe a little bit longer in the other dimension. So. So here's a view from the outside after the grass had kind of grown in. So you have the roll top on the left, it's classroom area on the right. Uh, there is a telescope pad area, so they extended this, the walkway, and they actually have power on these three stations. That's both AC and 12-volt DC. So if you bring your telescope out, you could actually set up on the pad area here and uh, have power if you need it. Uh, and then this other building is we'd like to use right now, you can see the orange uh, fence line there. Uh, we're not supposed to go near it uh, until they decide whether they're condemning it or are actually going to use it. Uh, but they call it the RADO, which is the Robotic Automated Telescope Observatory. So what our hope was that we would have a telescope situated up in that dome, fully robotic, and you can control it from down in the classroom and project it up on the screen in the, in the classroom. And then, you know, kids could come in and steer it to various places, on, uh, objects on the sky. Uh, in addition to what we had running in the roll top, and then wh whoever came outside to set up on the telescope pad area. The roll top has automation. It has go-to telescopes. That's the extent of the automation. Yeah. There's no external. We, we have yet to get it, it, um, internet connection into the building. They've come up to the building, but there's a controversy of who's going to pay the bill. <laughs> so, you know, the county puts a million dollars into this, and they don't have an OEM tail on the end of it. You know, it's like, what are they thinking? Whatever. <laughs> Frustrates the daylights out of me. So, next slide. So this was the official opening ceremony. It occurred on October 1st, a nice rainy day. Um, but uh, you can see Charles Olin here in the black suit. Uh, these are all various supervisors and county officials that came out to, to see the opening ceremony. Next slide. These are the Edelmans on the right there. They're the ones that actually donated the money for the telescopes that were purchased. And um, very grateful to them. They, there's actually some money left over. We're buying a lot of extra equipment, like eyepieces, focusers. Uh, we're planning to buy a CCD camera. Uh, in fact, if we ha anybody has a recommendation for that, um, willing to hear what you've got to say. Um, but it's been great that we actually had these donations because the county didn't seem to want to fork over the extra money to equip the place. So, next slide. So, what happened prior to the roll top being there, uh, I wasn't involved in this. Like I said, I was working up until last year. Uh, but they used to run public outreach se uh, sessions at the farm there on the grassy areas. And uh, you could see uh, where the fence was open here. You got a number of telescopes set up on the upper left there. On the right, you can see a lot of various children's uh, school groups coming to visit this sundial garden, as well as uh, you know people looking through telescopes at night. I think that's Alan Figgett's uh, five-inch uh, refractor, and uh, so that's what happened over the last you know 13 years. Novak has been a significant contributor and helper on that. They brought their telescopes out uh, while we were doing this, and this, this has been great. Fast forward n now to 2016-2017. Next slide is uh, we're now running public outreach on every Friday night when it's clear or partly cloudy. We will we'll open up the roof and uh, people will tend to wander in but even before sunset. It's amazing. They think they could see, you know, stars at, at, at in the daylight. We do actually show them that, you know, we could, you know, when Cirrus was up and some of the brighter stars, we actually show them that you could see a star. But we typically can look at Jupiter and Saturn this time of year and uh, until twilight finally fades. And we then, then look for those faint fuzzies. Um, but you can see the red lights on in there, and th that looks pretty bright in there, but it's actually not that quite that bright. We have, there's a dimmer control on these red lights uh, to keep it down. Uh, the, this uh, Tammy uh, is a Fairfax County employee. She's giving a class on the, you can actually see the eclipse map up there on the screen uh, to a bunch of students. Uh, there's Bill Burton on the bottom right there explaining some um, probably lunar or 
I don't know what you were explaining in that particular picture. Yeah, Venus and the Earth comparisons, right? And there's someone looking through the refractor. So again, we uh, basically, I'm a member of the Yanalima Society and NOVAC. We support, uh, folks like that tend to support running the telescopes there. We need more people to help. So if you're in the area and want to help out and volunteer, that's great. Bring your own telescope, that's great. You do have to move the telescope from your car up to the pads. It's a good probably 1,000 foot uh, uh, trek. So that, that is one issue that we're trying to deal with with the county right now. But uh, with the con possible con condemnation of the, uh, the tower, they can't come in through that entrance. So we have to come up this long walkway. Uh, but we could certainly use hope, help. Yeah. No. Oh, cart. Uh, I'm sorry, you said car. Oh, cart. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. It's, it's about six feet wide. It's a concrete, smooth sidewalk. Uh, the gate is probably about three and a half feet. Okay, and the parking lot is paved? Parking lot is paved, yes. So basically, it's paved all the way or concreted. Either way, it's smooth. It's all brand new. So it's, uh, it's in good shape. Uh, so you need to have some kind of cart, though. If you got a fairly big telescope, you want to haul up there. I'm sorry, not a thousand. You're right. You're right. Uh, it's yeah. probably more like two hundred. Two hundred feet. Two hundred feet. Yeah, yeah. Two hundred feet. Yeah. Um, and it has actually discouraged some Novak people from coming up because they have their telescopes are too big. And there used to be, and there still is, a paved road that leads the, just to the other side of that roll top, but that's too close to the Rado, the, the big tall tower, and the county's concerned about somebody getting injured and so they're keeping us out of that area for now. Okay. What so. about if, if they get that building re Well then yeah we'll have a challenge there to see if we can get the county to let us go in there. We used to drive in there all yeah. the time. That was you know past history. Uh, but we got a changeover of people. They seem to have a different attitude. One of them is worried about people driving onto the concrete surface itself and possibly breaking that up. It's not reinforced. So we have to keep, if, if we, we have to, we're going to have to convince them that we'll keep people onto the asphalt roadway, you know, if they ever open that up again, um, and stay off the concrete. So th we'll have a challenge in front of us. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> bureaucracy, you've got to deal with all the time. So next slide. So uh, we've started holding classes there. The county has something called the uh, Fairfax County Park Takes Program. Uh, it's basically all the, all the counties classes that they have at their 282 parks uh, basically stretched across the county uh, the yeah so just just google fairfax park takes and it should pop up i don't have the uh, the, the actual website up there uh, but that should get you to the to well, the right site decides, you have, and then you have to search in park takes. yeah once you're in park takes and you have to search whatever particular area of interest like uh, i'm teaching a meteor class and you type in meteor, then that, that class will come up. You type in the exploring the moon or put in moon, Bill's build class will come up. Put in telescopes, Alan Figgett's uh, introduction to telescopes class will come up. And uh, I'm sorry? If you do it by car, you do Turner Farm. Yeah. So that's the problem that some people have had uh, is finding Turner Farm doesn't seem to be in the system as a, a way to link in, into it. So it, it's. Yeah. But if you go, you know, if you go to the park authority and then search for Turner Farm Park, it comes up and the park takes thing or the direct link okay. to the classes to the park. So right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one thing, so, so we have t had to kind of decide what we were going to teach almost six months in advance because the county needs time to put their brochure together, their catalog together when they publish it. And so, you know, we, we'd come up with these dates actually six months ago. Uh, what we found is it kind of constrains us. If somebody comes up with an idea, we have to wait six months before we actually get it into the system. So what we decided uh, for the fall and moving beyond fall is to have something every month called an astronomical seminar. And that kind of made it generic. And we'll say, okay, in September, maybe we'll do a class on the planets. We'll spend a half an hour 
talking about the planets, and then we'll go and use the telescopes to observe the planets. And then maybe we'll do glo globular clusters or something like that. So we're looking for people who want to give an a, a seminar or something like that, and then couple it into using, you know, have a little classroom experience, and then go ahead and use this, get some telescope experience for the public as well, uh, assuming it's clear. And so, uh, so this is an example of uh, Bill's course. You saw his talk, if you saw his talk this morning, uh, he basically had a class there, I think it was about 10 or 12 folks. Uh, and there was a live laptop view of the moon. And so he could actually point at objects and then ba basically sh tell them what to look for in the eyepiece and say, okay, I want to look at this particular feature, this particular rill. Can you see that when you look through the eyepiece? You know, and it's a little bit different than looking on the screen than actually looking at the eyepiece. For this one, so this, this image is based off of the refractor. I had an imaging camera a ZWO 174. He talked about talk on, on the moon. Right. Isn't that what this is? That's what this is. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So it's an exploring, he calls it exploring the moon class. And he spends right. time in the classroom and then he goes. Three Fairfax County and the Yeah. The camera so is on. The camera is on. The refractor. The refractor, which, the refractor which is a county. Yeah, but we actually had two extra volunteers there that day, so we actually set up all four telescopes operating, and so we actually had Jupiter up there on one of them, just because you can't have 15 people looking through Bill's telescope all at the same time, right? And yeah, you can have some around the laptop, but we also kept the other people entertained while he kind of cycled through his various people, so we kind of coordinated together on that, you know. So, so go to the next slide. So one thing we found as we've been operating in the last three, four months, five months, is the public loves to whip out their cell phones and try to take pictures through the telescope. Uh, and so these are some of, some of the successful shots that were taken. Uh, that is a splotch apparently on that cell phone that is not a lunar eclipse uh, um, on, on Jupiter. But uh, we actually have now an adapter for, for folks that we can actually put on the eyepiece and they can come along and put it on there. It depends upon how busy we are. If we got a lot of, a big crowd in there and it's pretty tight, we'll just have people cycling through looking uh, visually. But if it tends to thin out a little bit, then people get to use their cell phones and they really seem to like doing that kind of stuff. Uh, we actually caught Venus in the daylight. Um, we opened up in one, one particular day and uh, just before inferior conjunction, I think this is a day before, and we actually got to see that in the refractor again. Um, and wasn't that, it turned out it was pretty far away from the sun. It wasn't, uh, I was expecting it to be much closer to the sun than, than where it was. The next shot is uh, that same imager that I was using in Bill's class. I just decided to go ahead and play with it on the refractor one night. Uh, we had a pretty good, clear, stable night. And this time, there was actually a double eclipse going on in Jupiter. By the time I'd set up, there was only one shadow left. That's the image on the upper left caught Saturn. That was really low in elevation. I think it was maybe only about 15 degrees above the horizon. So it doesn't look that great. Got a nice globular cluster in there. Uh, the moon. And of course, this is a two minute exposure of the whirlpool. Now, when we look at the whirlpool in that refractor in the light polluted skies that we have, we can't even see the Milky Way very often. I think very, I think you've seen, seen it once uh, from Great Falls. Um, we, it just looks like barely visible fuzzy. But uh, with a two minute exposure, a uh, little push processing on the enhance enhancement there, I was able to see uh, all the arms. Now I didn't do, you know, you, you've heard yesterday about all the processing you should be doing, flat fields, dark, dark removal. Of course, this is a video, so you don't necessarily need to do dark removal. Um, you know, sh stacking, finding the best image. I didn't do any of that. I was just running through the night, going to object to object, trying to get some nice, uh, nice photographs, just see how the imager worked. The imager I bought is really for meteor work. It's got large pixels. What you want for this type of work is a smaller pitch size, three micron instead of the five micron that I have. Uh, but still, I thought the pictures were pretty, pretty decent uh, that came off of that system. Next slide. So where's it located? Uh, anybody who knows, I don't know, know the Washington area out in the north northwestern suburbs. Uh, we're on the Virginia side of the Potomac River. This is Route 7. Tyson's Corner is down and to the right. Sterling, Virginia is up to the left. Georgetown Pike runs across the top there and there's Springvale Road and they're right, the road comes right off of here. It's the parking lot here. And this is that road that you were asking about, which you can, uh, someday we might be able to bring telescopes up 
be that way, but normally we just have to walk them up uh, to where the roll top is located. Okay, and la last slide. So come on out, visit us on Friday nights. Uh, we typically run the classes uh, on Wednesdays. Some of them sometimes are on Saturdays. Uh, they'll change as, we, as the year uh, progresses and depends upon when the people who can teach it are available. But usually we do classes on Wednesday nights. Uh, we got one coming up next week. Uh, actually, what, three days from now? Uh, that's on telescopes and Bill's gonna be doing his moon class uh, a week from Wednesday. Uh, you can sign up for a class via the Fairfax County Park System. Uh, but we're also looking for people who want to give a class. If you're interested and in have some specialty that you want to talk about uh, to the public, you know, come uh, approach us. We're, we have to have in the winter classes by the end of July here. So if you've got some ideas, you're welcome to, uh, to participate. You could also just come out and use the telescopes uh, as a volunteer, helping when the public's there if you don't have your own. You could bring your own. Uh, that would help us as well. It's tough when we get about 50 people show up in the building. We're only allowed, you know, 15 or more into that telescope room. It's great to be able to have some scopes outside to help distribute the, uh, the people load, essentially. So that's all I've got. Any questions? Uh, thanks. Oh, right. Right. So the Analemma Society keeps track of uh, wh where we post, whether we're going to actually be open or not. And they post that by the Friday noon. Uh, it's the analemma.com. No, analemma.org. Yeah. And OK. Right. Not the full, not the full slides. I think I've shown the, the telescopes when they were installed. Yeah. And we, well, we had a Novak. Yeah, we had a Novak in invite session where uh, it was Novak only members came on one night. I think it was a Saturday night or something like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And we could we could do that again. That's not a problem. Yeah. County usually doesn't charge us for that. We consider it training. Well, we're supposed to have, <laughs> we have to schedule work nights. Yes. You can't just go open at any time you want. Yeah, it's yeah. The official right. So we do a lot of training sessions. <laughs> <laughs> we train there for the first That's right. That's right. Well, they need, they, need a, they need alignment once in a while, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Well, they got to be collimated. Yeah. You know, that test out, that test out that new eyepiece. That's right. You're right. <laughs> okay. Okay.